Welcome to my demo of a block pen drawing using a Charles Barg plate. This exercise is in Figure Drawing Atelier, a great book by Julia Aristides. I apologize in advance that I underestimated the reflective quality of this paper on camera. My drawing is hard to see at best, but what is easier to see is the way I block in the original drawing in the book. And I do believe that seeing how I approach that block in will be the most useful part of this video. I start by drawing a vertical line that places the figure somewhere on my page. I pick this place somewhat arbitrarily, but in the center of the page, knowing that the whole face will have to fit. I use my skewer to determine the upper limit of the vertical line. And then I measure from the top of the page to that vertical line. I want to be sure that I'm drawing my drawing at the same height as the original so that my eyes can scan back and forth without having to go up or down on the page. Next, I use my skewer to measure the total length of that vertical line. I prefer using a skewer to gauge my measurements, ensuring that this becomes an exercise in observation and not an exercise in using a ruler. Next, I measure the horizontal line that crosses her eyes. Placing this vertical line and the horizontal line that crosses her eyes on my page determines where I will be placing the drawing. I double check my measurements. The initial block in is always slow going. I will be drawing straight lines and measuring and remeasuring. It's not until about an hour into it that it starts looking like the drawing I'm aiming for. But getting this initial block in right makes the rest of the drawing go rather smoothly. I use my skewer to determine the far left point of the drawing from the center line. And then the far right point of the drawing from the center line. Now that I've determined the height and the width of my drawing, I could draw a notional box around it. But for this drawing, I choose not to. I will go straight to the block end phase. I'm double checking measurements before I continue. If you could see my drawing, all you would see are a few dots that seem random, but they are actually showing important landmarks. Here I'm measuring from the center of the horizontal line between the eyes to the point of the nose. This will create another important horizontal landmark. At this point in my drawing, I do keep my lines light. I keep my lines light throughout the block end until I'm ready to commit, which is really towards the end of the block end. I want to keep my lines light because if I make mistakes along the way, they are easier to erase. Also, as the drawing develops, most of the block in lines, if they are drawn in light, will just get absorbed into the drawing. I continue to double check my measurements. On my skewer, I'm actually using my fingernail to show me where the measurement should be and not just the fat pad of my index finger. 
by using my fingernail, I have a very specific place where it lays on the skewer, and it's easier to be accurate. Now I'm starting to block in the original reference picture I'm using. The initial block in should be more generic than specific. Ideally, maybe just seven to 10 straight lines. As I start blocking in this image, I'm getting way too specific too soon. We believe that getting specific right away will help us get detailed, but the opposite is true. Getting a more generic block in drawn in accurately will serve us better. It's easier to draw seven accurate lines as opposed to 20 small straight accurate lines. You can see that as I work my way around, I'm starting to realize I've just drawn too much of a detailed block in. Now that I've gone all the way around her head, I'm going to start over. Instead of carving really into a lot of the details, I start with a straight line across the top of her head, a straight line down the side. I need to think more in terms of the bigger idea of this shape as opposed to all the smaller ideas. Instead of carving around the hair and under the chin and into the neck, I go straight down to the bottom of the drawing. And instead of trying to work my way around the bottom curve, I just make a straight line to that center line and then a straight line to the right that goes straight up to her hair. This is a much more generic block in And if I can get this outer shape correct, the inner shapes will be much easier to figure out. I erase out some of the previous block in so that I can focus on the few lines that I really wanna get in. This block in is really about eight straight lines around her head. I double check the measurement because originally I had measured how long this vertical line was. But the top of her head is not at the top of this vertical line and I want to be sure that I'm drawing it at the same eye level. Once I'm happy with where this line has to go, I draw it in. I draw it in much longer than it needs to be. By drawing my block in lines longer than they actually are, they create really useful areas where they cross each other. I can use those angles and negative spaces to check for accuracy. Here I'm measuring from the center line to where the next line crosses this first horizontal line at the top of her head. I measure the same point on the other side. Where does that next line cross? The more accurate I can be at the block and stage, the smoother my drawing will go for the rest of the process and the more accurate it will be. Erasing inaccuracies at this stage is much easier than erasing detailed shading towards the end of the drawing. I am just checking and double checking this line because this line determines where the sides of the head start to slope down. 
and that's an important landmark for the shape of her head. Here I'm using my skewer to estimate the angle that the next line needs to be drawn. Estimating angles can be difficult. I put the skewer on that angle and I think that it points towards two o'clock on a clock. And I also try to bring it back and forth between the original and my drawing at the same angle, but that's really pretty challenging. I draw that line in again longer than it needs to be. And again, I try to estimate the angle of incline. To double check my accuracy, I also look at the triangle that is formed from the long line that I drew at the top of her head and where this line intersects it. You can see a little bit of a triangle in that corner and I'm trying to estimate what that negative shape looks like. There you can really see the triangle I'm talking about. I'm double checking again from the center line to the outermost point of her hair basically the outermost point of the drawing. And from that dot, I figure out where it crosses at the line on top of her head. If I had drawn that line at the top of her head, only the length of her head, it would not be able to be of use to me now. But by having drawn it longer, I can connect this long line of the block end. Again, I estimate the angles. I've measured from the center line to the outer point, and I get that part of the block in drawn in. Here I extend out the two lines, the center line and the next slanted line on the other side of her head. And again, I'm looking for where they meet. I find the same corresponding dot on my drawing from the center line to where the two other lines meet. This gives me the next line of my block end from the top of her head down the right side of her face to the outermost point on the right side of the drawing. I enjoy doing block ends. It feels like a jigsaw puzzle that I'm putting together. And since it is just straight lines and there's no detailing or shading going on, it feels relatively pressure free. I also really enjoy the moment when it starts to look like the subject. We're a ways from that point, but it's still fun. Here again, I'm trying to estimate the angle of my next line of the block end. This is pointing roughly towards one o'clock and I put in a really light line I know that this line butts right up against that part of her hair that I measured earlier as being the rightmost part of the drawing. I'm comparing angles of different lines now to see how they compare to the lines on my drawing. At 
this stage, I'm not even looking at her face anymore. I'm really focused on my block in that I drew around her face. I'm trying to capture the accuracy of the block in only. I've almost stopped seeing any other details in this drawing. I measure the angle on the left side of the drawing that goes from the leftmost point down. And that angle is somewhat pointing at 11 o'clock. I draw in a plumb line. At this point, I'm just measuring the plumb line, but I'm looking for a point of reference where the corner of her neck meets some other landmark on her face. I use my skewer as a plumb line. I line it up vertically and see where that corner of the neck is, lines up almost perfectly with a small line that is on the left of her eye. I measure the distance from that line to the center line. And I find it on my drawing. I double check the measurement. using my nail to mark the spot. I see that I'm accurate and I decide to drop a straight line from that line down, which tells me where the corner of the neck is on my drawing. I double check by measuring that point against the center line. Getting this line accurate will help me draw the bottom part of her hair, her jawline, her neck, and the beginning of her shoulder by using the negative space between those areas and this line. I estimate these angles that are at the bottom of the drawing. And again, I draw my lines longer than they actually are in the reference picture so that I can use where they intersect the other lines as reference points. I measure the distance from one corner to the other corner, and I just double check my drawing. This is the stage for accuracy and checking and double checking, not the stage for rushing forward. Now I have the major vertical line and horizontal line in. I call those my crosshairs. And I have the major block in of the contour in. I start looking for other landmarks, such as the bottom of the nose, the center of the mouth, the chin, and the shadow underneath the chin.
Having measured and rechecked myself several times, I'm ready to commit to somewhat darker lines on my own block end. These are still relatively light because eventually they will either get absorbed into my drawing or I will erase them. Even though I'm committing to my lines, my eyes are still scanning back and forth between my reference picture and my drawing. I'm willing to keep correcting. In fact, I keep correcting throughout the whole process of the drawing. As each line I put down, and later each shading value I put down, helps me determine the accuracy of the lines and values that came before. Here I'm extending the horizontal line underneath her nose to see where does it cross on my block end of the contour. I'm also checking the horizontal line that marks the part between her lips. Where does that cross? Drawings are full of coincidences, so you might find that that line that marks the center of her mouth actually coincides with where the hair tucks into the jaw. Even where there are no coincidences, I can use my extended lines to find negative shapes that help my accuracy. This is slow, patient work, but I find that the more block ins you do, the more you learn to trust the process, and you understand that the drawing will come together nicely. So there's no sense of needing to rush ahead to make it start looking like your subject. Here I start drawing her hair, her jaw, her neck, really using the negative shapes between those lines and my block in lines. I use my skewer to double check my measurements and I carve in some of this detail. I start working my way around the whole perimeter using the negative space and my block in to carve in more accurate shapes. I work my way around the whole head in this way, using my skewer, using my block in and negative spaces. I am still working from bigger shapes to slightly smaller shapes. Always from general idea to more specific idea.
With the contour of her head in place, I'm ready to start looking at some of her features. Even with the features, I'm starting with the biggest shapes and we'll work down to the smaller shapes. In this particular example, the bigger shape that I'm now dealing with is the hair. It might be different for a different project, but always think in terms of the biggest shape, the next biggest shape, the next biggest shape, working your way down to smaller shapes little by little. It's easier for our eyes to see these bigger shapes. And by placing them accurately, I am narrowing down with much more accuracy where the details need to go. As I draw in her hair, I'm looking at the different shapes it creates. For example, on the right side of our drawing, between the horizontal line that marks her eyebrows, the center line, and then the curve of the bangs wrapping around her hair, we get a nice triangle shape. I'm using that to try to get the accurate curve of her hair. I'm placing my skewer on the horizontal line that crosses over her eyebrows, and I'm measuring from the right side to the left side where the hair is. How big is the forehead area? Sometimes it's easier to draw the line in and then check for accuracy. And sometimes it's easier not to draw the line in and just put a dot where your measurement tells you it will go. For me, this varies from detail to detail that I'm drawing. If you're new to this way of drawing, you'll find that you're constantly having to remeasure and redraw. But the more you do it, the more accurate you will become. You might end up just double checking yourself once or twice and then being able to move on once you've really gotten used to observational estimates. Now I'm moving on to drawing the details around her eyes. 
and I'm really just using all the negative shapes that I see in between the horizontal lines that I've drawn in. With my center line and my hair line and the horizontal line for where her eyes go, the horizontal line for where her eyebrows go, I've really created a pretty small window in which I have to draw her eye. This is a much more accurate placement than if I had tried to place it inside a blank page. I pay careful attention to where lines cross over other lines and eyeball the distance between those lines and my center line. I'm also paying attention to the width of the nose and where do those lines line up with the eye I just drew. I'm using an imaginary plumb line looking straight down between my eye and my nose as I draw them to see if things are lining up where they should. You can use a skewer for this or you can even draw a line for this. If you use a skewer, be sure you're using it on both your reference photo and your drawing so that you have a comparison. Even the features are done in a block-in style. Very few lines, mostly straight, just capturing the biggest shape and gesture of our drawing. Here you see me actually drawing in a line to see where the nose edge is in comparison to the lips underneath it. I slowly work my way around all the features this way. I continue to double check my drawing with the skewer and with plumb lines. The width of the nose, the width of the mouth. As I correct the shape of her mouth, I realize I also need to correct some of the lines that I drew around her mouth. 
It was in drawing the part of her lips that I was able to understand that some of the other parts I had drawn of her mouth were drawn incorrectly. Now that I have her mouth drawn in, I measure from the part of the lips to the bottom of the chin to understand where that line should go. In preparing for this drawing, I did a little bit research about the Charles Bard plate that this is based on. And I found a really interesting story that I would like to share with you as you watch me draw the rest of the block in. At the end of the 19th century, this young girl's lifeless body was pulled from the River Seine in Paris. There were no signs of violence, and so they decided that she had probably committed suicide. She was taken to the Paris morgue for identification. At that time, the morgue was located behind Notre Dame. And unknown dead were displayed for the public to see and, it was hoped, identify. This young woman was never identified. It is said that the examining pathologist was so mesmerized by her beauty that he was compelled to make a death mask of her face. Death masks are plaster casts of a mold taken from the face of a dead individual. Death masks have really been made forever. They go all the way back as far as ancient Egypt, but they became more commonplace after the 13th century. And in France, in the 1800s, these sort of death masks became valued as somewhat morbid but fashionable home fixtures. Because this young girl was so undeniably beautiful, many copies of her mask sold. And these plaster masks were hung throughout countless homes in Paris. It is said also that her death mask became so famous that it drew the attention of a lot of artists and philosophers, including Albert Camus. I'm wondering if Charles Barg was another one of the artists who was compelled to draw the face mask once he saw it. I found an impressive list of books and poems and artwork that were all inspired by this young girl's face. Death Mass fell out of popularity in the early 1900s, and her story may have ended there if it wasn't for a Norwegian toy manufacturer, Asmond Lerdal. His story takes place about 80 years after her body was found in the Sien. He was a toy manufacturer who developed dolls using what was then a new experimental type of soft material called plastic. And his doll became Toy of the Year. A few years later, he was approached by two doctors who had come up with CPR. They explained that they needed a lifelike doll to demonstrate it on. They embarked on a history-making project to develop this doll. Using plastic, they produced a life-size functioning mannequin that could be used to demonstrate and teach CPR reliably. But the mannequin needed a face. And at this point, Lardal the toy manufacturer remembered that very enigmatic smile of a plaster mask that hung on the wall of his in-law's house. This mask was, of course, our unknown young girl. 
Lardal and the two doctors who invented CPR, Dr. Lind and Dr. Safar, introduced the world's first patient simulator in 1960. The development of this mannequin also changed Lardar's toy company mission from creating children's joy to helping save lives. Over the 60 years that followed since the introduction of the first mannequin, it has been estimated by the American Heart Association that over 500 million people have been trained in CPR and over 2 million lives have been saved. What an extraordinary legacy for this beautiful, unnamed suicide victim that was pulled out of the River Seine in the late 1880s. I found myself falling in love with every single line of this block in as I moved along. I think this is true of almost everything we spend a lot of time drawing. All the observation and understanding what we're looking at helps us connect intimately with our subjects. And I think it is impossible to draw a thoughtful drawing based on observation without falling a little bit in love with our subjects. I can certainly understand why this young woman's face inspired so many poets, writers, and artists, including Charles Bard. I start to feel like I'm nearing the end of my block-in. As my eyes continue to scan the reference image and my drawing back and forth, looking for differences, I realize that I have completely forgotten to draw in the shadow underneath her chin. I use the center line and negative spaces to help me understand the direction that this line has to be drawn in. Next, I want to draw the line that defines the depth of the plaster around her neck. I recognize that this is a long video, but rather than speed it up, I wanted to walk you through my block in in real time. I'm putting in the final touches, the last defining lines that I see in the reference picture. And I start committing more to my block in lines by darkening up. I work my way around quite methodically as I darken up and make final corrections. As I correct some of my lines, they're only over by a width or two of the pencil's tip, but I have to go in and erase the mistake lines or it starts changing the whole shape that I'm trying to correct. As I study the shapes of the nose, again, I make corrections. I erase mistake lines after I've made my corrections. 
and that helps me understand if the other features are correct or if I need to make corrections in those areas as well. As I near the end of my drawing, I just reinstate some of the fainter lines and I'm ready to call this drawing done. I hope you've enjoyed this demo.